Well, I'm, I'm really glad that the church is, that the province is doing this. Um, because one of the things I've realized as I look back, how many opportunities we've had to talk about mm -hmm. racism and, and just and just haven't done it. So um, that's the first thing that, that, that I'd like to just express my appreciation. Same, same here. Yep. And, and you and I, in working together through the years, talked about this a lot and tried different things. What, what were some of the childhood experiences or influences you had that made you well, aware I, of that? I, I grew up in, in Winston-Salem in the 50s. Um, and I remember when Sears Roebuck was at 4th and Broad and you'd walk into the lobby and there'd be two water fountains and four restrooms. Yep. And then in, in 1957, we moved to Nazareth, Pennsylvania. Um, small town, 6,000 people. I think there was one black family that lived outside of town, but I mean, it, it, it was obviously living in Winston-Salem, you're well aware of a black community, but you live in a very white world. Right. And I lived in a very white world in Nazareth. Um, hmm. And then when I was 16, I got a summer job in the, in the Poconos as a dishwasher. And the assistant chef, Sonny, and the cook, George, the three of us stayed, uh, had, we had rooms above the storehouse behind the, uh, the hotel. Uh, and George was black, George Mills, the, the chef. Well, one night, Sonny and I were getting ready to go to bed. Well, George would often disappear after dinner, and then we'd hear him come back in late at night. Well, one evening, George came back early, and he said, guys, get dressed and come with me, and he had a grin on his face. And so we got in the car, and we drove a couple miles up Route 209, and my family had been in the area. I thought I knew it pretty well, but it was a road I hadn't noticed before. Went a couple hundred yards back that road to the Hillside Inn. The Hillside Inn was an all-black resort in the 1950s, and George would go up there and just have an absolute ball, and he had us come <laughs> along. We were the only, us two young guys, we were the only white people in the, in the whole place, and, and it was just, a, just a, a great, fun experience. And I took that away and, and pretty much forgot about it until 40, 45 years later, I read a column in the Winston-Salem Journal by Nat Irvin, who yeah. used to write for the journal and taught at Wake Forest, about Albert Murray, who was a mentor for Nat. Um, and, and I'm not sure how they all knew each, they knew each other, but uh, Albert Murray was a judge in New York. And in the mid-1950s, Albert Murray got together with a Jewish lawyer because they felt that there ought to be a place in the Poconos where blacks could go and for vacation. Our family had a cabin not far from the Hillside Inn and, and it was a membership uh, organization on the lake and no Jews or blacks were permitted, mm -hmm. which I never talked to my dad about that. I'm kind of surprised we were there, but, but, but anyway. So this night that George took us up to the Hillside Inn, turns out that place has, had been built by um, a black judge from New York and a Jewish businessman because there was no place for, mm. because everything was so seg segregated in the, in the Poconos. And, and I found out about all this, you know, all, all these years later. Then when I finished seminary, I ended up at First Church in, in New York, which at that point had um, a lot of immigrant Moravians from the Caribbean region. And I very clearly remember there was a lot of tension in one family from Guyana because there were three, two college-age students and one a little younger who were very much, this is in the 60s, late 60s, early 70s, who got very much engaged in the um, civil rights movement uh, in, in New York. And the parents were very upset about that. Um, mm -hmm. they, they said, you know, that's, that's not our fight. You know, you don't need to be getting involved with, with all these radical people in those difficult areas of the city. Um, and as I reflected on that later, uh, I, I have come to realize that slavery is very much still, the heritage of slavery is still very much in the fabric of our society and has to do with racism. But it was also true in the West Indies, in Jamaica, mm. um, Guyana, you know, all, all those black Moravians were Africans th that were brought over as slaves. So uh, I, I'd be interested 
to know more about slavery in the West Indies and slavery here because obviously things turned out very differently and, and we have this terrible baggage of slavery in the post-slavery years coming all the way up in the present time uh, that, that was not true in some of those islands. So mm. the, the slavery history that, that we deal with was, was not the same there even though, you know, so that, that was another revelation to me from New York is the role that slavery did or didn't play um, in, in racism. Then from New York, I went to Philadelphia and uh, to a, um, a mixed race middle class community with a mixed race uh, middle class Moravian church. <laughs> and there was a strip of land, including a shopping center and a city park. And the other side of that was an old Philadelphia blue collar neighborhood. One of our members lived there and I remember visiting her and sitting on the porch with her husband and so help me, that could have been Archie Bunker sitting there. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> that, that was, and but one of the things I remember is the white kids from that neighborhood and the black kids from our neighborhood used, used to get into fights and sometimes they literally went after each other with rocks and bricks and chains on the church lawn uh, because that was in this demilitarized zone in the middle. And when that happened, the police used to come down and they'd send the white kids home and take the black kids up to the police station and start calling black parents. Um, mm. And so that's another dimension of racism, you know, in this country. And then finally, when, when I got to St. Paul's in, in Maryland, we had um, very much a, a, a mixed race, middle class community. And the black members of the church were those who, who had really made it into the privileged arena that most of us white folks lived in. And we never talked about race there. Um, when I got involved in the minister's conference in Winston-Salem, that's where I began to hear a lot about school issues, about housing issues, mm -hmm. where I heard about the parents giving the talk to the boys in the family. Um, all that stuff, I'm sure, our black members at St. Paul's experienced, but, but we never, uh, mm -hmm. along the way, but we never talked about that stuff, and that was a missed opportunity. So, so I, I, I guess part of what all this is doing is I look at my own experience and relationship with individuals in terms of this bigger picture of a segregated Poconos and, and black and Jew coming together of the history of slavery, uh, of, of police uh, action, it, it has led me to realize th that, uh, that, that racism is, as, as I think of it, it, is really something that has to do with, with our society. And, and it doesn't have all that much to do with individuals. Um, mm. let, let me just stop there for a minute. I'll come <laughs> back to some of that later on, but I've done a lot of talking. No, um, it's okay. I mean, but I'll, I'll come back a little. I'm much like you. I was born and raised in Winston-Salem. Um, and in, in the early days of my childhood, I neither saw black people much, had no interactions with mm -hmm. black or African-Americans at all, um, other than to see someone out in public with parents. Mm -hmm. um, went to the same stores with the two sets of bathrooms and water fountains. And I asked questions about that. My mother was good to answer my questions. And that was a, I've always thought about that. Um, because one side of my family uh, was very open and talked and wanted to discuss. And then others and uh, extended family were pretty hard shell about that. So part of my childhood remembrance is about race, period, had to do with this split between knowing mm -hmm. in one set of family members we could talk, including my nuclear family, and you didn't hear the slurs and you didn't hear the names. Mm -hmm. but in other settings, the N-word was used, and I remember how, how harsh that felt and sounded to me because that's not how we, mm -hmm. we talked. But I went to school in segregated schools. Yep. I didn't know any people of color um, as a child. And I've thought about this a lot because it wasn't until I was 
in, I went to a segregated high school. Mm -hmm. And in the summers, late high school and college, I worked for a construction company. Mm -hmm. And there were a lot of African-American workers. And I got to know one of the older men, uh, Willie was his name. And he and I struck a friendship and we talked and joked. And I realized um, how much fun it was to, to interact with him. And he, he taught me some things. Interestingly enough, I had a very severe accident one day on site. Uh, building a building that's not far from where we're sitting. <laughs> I almost got electrocuted with a short out on a 220 mm. volt concrete vibrator and I fell off a 14 foot wall wow. as a result of that. And Willie, who was working with me, mm -hmm. uh, is the one that jumped off that wall into the mud and stuff at the bottom of that site and picked me up and helped me get out of there. Uh, mm. and was the first one to say, are you okay, boy? <laughs> and I said, yes, thank you. But um, even into college, they, they were just beginning to be African-American students, really, at public universities in the mid-60s. And there were one or two guys in our, on our hall in college that were young men of color. I you know, had acquaintances with them. But when I graduated from college, I taught high school for several years, and the mm -hmm. schools by then were integrated, and I had African-American students, and that's when I really mm -hmm. had more interactions with young people who were black or African-American. Um, and I laugh because I grew up here at this congregation as a child for the most part, and we, the people of color I saw here were the Moravians from the mission field right. when the Caribbean right. came. And, and we always had such a good time and it always seemed odd to me why we knew them and had relationships with them, but out there. There was a place for them in our churches here, um, but yeah. not for the local uh, More people less. of color. And that, that's part of the transition, I think, for me. You know, my, in my nuclear family, it was God loves everybody. We're all the same, don't discriminate. You're not supposed to do that. Mm -hmm. That's not the mm -hmm. Christian thing to do. And it was, it was in the 60s when I was growing and the college years where that sort of don't discriminate moved into civil rights. That the system mm -hmm. has to protect the rights and the, for yeah. everyone. And the justice part of racism, as I began to think about my own development, came about through that recognition. Everyone has the same civil rights, everyone is the same in God's sight. But I didn't find a lot in the church. There was that tension in the Moravian churches in the South anyway, in the 60s around civil rights and who was really active. Even some of the clergy who were very active were um, punished almost yeah. by members yeah. who didn't want that. We're not gonna do that here. And I remember how angry that made me feel. And some of my mentors when I ended up in the ministry were some of those ministers that stood up and said, no, you know, we're not going to accept segregation and we're not going to accept that kind of racial injustice. Um, so in some ways, I, I think about my life, it's, it's a lot different, but in some ways it's still a white world on a day-to-day -day basis in terms of how, where I live and how I live. Uh, to seek out relationships, interracial relationships, is still something that I have to do with intention. And I know you did that when we were working together, and I always had great respect for that, and I'm glad. Yeah. Well, a, a lot of that I just kind of fell into because um, ecumenical ministers groups were always important to me. And, and, I, and the only ecumenical ministers group I could find in Winston-Salem was the yeah. Minister's Conference, which was essentially all black. Right. You know, Sid Kelly went uh, from time to time. And as I said before, that's, that's where I came to um, a much deeper understanding of, of the, of the dy dynamics of the system and, 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 and racism. And, and, and today my my world is still pretty much the world I live in is, is a white world. I mm -hmm. have very little contact w with people of color. But of course, the, d the difference is with, with all kinds of media, the whole subject of race, racism, and racist um, is, is very much around us. And, 
and and I I rarely use the term ra racist. I, I think hmm. to to have two boxes, one box for people who are racists, and the other box for people who are not racist. <laughs> You know, it's a totally futile effort. Um, there are people who are pretty much, by anyone's estimation, racist. Um, you know, we could probably name a few, which <laughs> we don't need to do. Uh, but then there's some of us, I think a lot of us, who are caught in this web of racism that does more to us than we sometimes realize it does. Um, t two, two examples. Um, I've, uh, I, I hear people talk about incidents they have, you know, when they're shopping or at the, at the grocery store or some kind of contact here or there, and, and they're describing to me positive conversations or, or, or interactions that were very good things. But I never he, uh, hear them say that, that well, y you know, I was, I was at... Um, um, Harris Teeter and I met a white person and we talked about <laughs> such and such. But I do hear people say, oh, and, and, and then I met a black person who's such and such. You know, and what that says to me is our mindset mm -hmm. is that normal is white. Um, and if you're not white, you're not normal. So then I have to say that this was a not normal person I was talking to. And the other thing that, that I'm not very proud of myself about, but um, you know, I'll look at the paper and I'll see a story about a, a, a shooting or a drug bust or something like that. Um, and my de an immediate assumption is, I I'll bet that was a black neighborhood. Mm. Um, and I said, well, wait, wait a minute, why are you assuming that? Um, so I guess if, if, if I were going to use the term racist, I would have to say that to some degree I'm a racist mm. because because that stuff colors my outlook and my thinking. It's race-based. And as, you know, as much as my bone marrow is what you said before about God made us all equal, we're an mm -hmm. equal standing before him, you know, that's so fundamental to me, but I still have this other stuff that nails me. Well, I, the same thing happens to me when it comes to privilege. Mm -hmm. You know, I was, I was thinking about this for our conversation. So I go from the don't discriminate, love everyone, we're all the same in God's eyes in my childhood to a college time of civil rights centered comparisons and introspection. And are you going, I went to some of the rallies and did some things on the campus, uh, but I didn't do as much as I could at all, you know, but I showed up, got out, taught school before I went to seminary and had interactions and and uh, one of my students one day, one of my black students said, Mr. Sides, you're a pretty cool guy, but you won't come to my house for dinner and you won't live on my side of town. And I thought, I did go to dinner, however. <laughs> and we had a great conversation out of that, but it made me think. And as I got into the ministry and began to interact and deal with things, I began to face my own struggle about lamenting over privilege, white privilege. And I see so many people our color or whatever you want to say, whites that just don't want to either examine, accept, mm -hmm. to look at, or, or for at least what feels like spiritually for me, the task of lamenting mm -hmm. that I look through this privileged lens because I'm, I'm white and I don't care what I do or you know whether I'm a minister or whatever. That's a piece of the reality that I live in that carries with it such discrimination in itself, and that's the same thing yep. you're saying. We're that's part of my yeah. bone marrow. And 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 I th I think our kids need to know that and need to know how it happened. I you know I I think I think our kids need to know the history of this country, in in terms of mm -hmm. slavery and for that matter in terms of of what we did with the Native Americans before that. Both both of which were s systematic ways to destroy other people to build our own economic um, system, our own economic privilege. Now, I, 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 I don't want to, quote, you know, we hear about making kids feel guilty. Well, I'm not looking to lay a guilt trip on, on, on any kids or anything else, but I do think they need to know that history and, and to know that some of that history, that know A, that we are privileged, mm -hmm. and B, that's, that's how we got here. Mm -hmm. And we continue to be able to make choices. Mm -hmm in terms of what we do and how we do it, 
both as a citizen and as a person of faith because we are, are privileged. Mm -hmm. um, well, I've had some really good conversations, you know, with my kids through the years, and, and I am encouraged, and my grandchildren were with us for a week, a few weeks ago, and they're 14 and 12, and, it, and they can articulate, and I'm so glad that, that mm -hmm. they're being taught to articulate their feelings as well as their opinions yeah. about racism. I think the other experience I had, and you and I were involved in this with the Provincial Elders Conference, we went through a period a very defined intent around racial reconciliation, and that was the term we used. Mm -hmm. and, and I think the church in general is willing, our Moravian church is willing to face that need and to think in that way. But I think I've kind of moved, I've found the movement not so much about reconciling with racial stuff, but to define, to speak to, and to eliminate racism is a much more profound and needed movement mm -hmm. and I am hearing at least our denomination and congregations some of them at least open to saying we've got to be activist we have to be intentional to speak to racism it's not going to go away because we just think it's a bad idea we love your neighbor and that'll solve everything uh, yeah and and trying to build those one-on-one -on -one relationships across racial barriers, that, that, that's important. That, that's a good thing, it can make life easier, but, but that's not, that doesn't solve the problem of racism and the very deep um, issues that, that we're facing in this country today, yeah. yeah.